Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I'd like to uh, begin first by uh, introducing the rest of the team uh, before we get started. So we have on my right hand side, we have uh, Mecca, and we have Kelia, and we have uh, Isaac um, behind the cameras. So we are all very, very excited to be here. And I'd like to begin first by uh, asking you a question. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the country of Rwanda? Put your hand. Wow, that's about three quarters of you all. Um, I think this is very exciting. So we are all coming from Rwanda. Uh, we are part of a group called I Debate Rwanda. And what we are doing is we're doing a tour of the United States in order to share about the history of Rwanda and to use the history of Rwanda as not only um, a lesson uh, for the rest of the world, but then also for, as, um, as a deterrence for many people. Uh, we usually say that Rwanda is a great example of and is a mirror to every man's soul because Rwanda shows what happens, all the wrongs that happen when we refuse um, to accept differences. But then also Rwanda shows what the good of what human beings can do to restore um, life and to um, live right after tragedy. So today what we wanted to do is we're going to have a presentation which will be about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, what, we all, what we ask from all of you is that you just engage with us. We're going to make presentation, tell stories, and then after that we're going to have a Q&A session. But after the Q&A session, we are going to do uh, something a little bit more light and a little bit more fun. We're going to do some traditional dancing, right? So I can see some of you brought your dancing shoes. And even if you don't have the dancing shoes at home, you can dance with no shoes, right? So you still dance anyways. But uh, what I would like to do is I would like to call on uh, Mecca. And what Mecca is going to do is to give us a little bit of context to what happened in Rwanda where uh, 24 years ago we had uh, one of the worst genocide in the history of mankind. And after Mecca is done giving us a context, um, Kelia is going to share a story from one of our colleagues uh, who remained in Rwanda. And then after that, we'll watch a video. And after watching the video, I'll come back and answer the question of why should you care about what you hear? Uh, does that sound like a good plan? All right, thank you all very much. So uh, let us all just welcome uh, Mecca to give us a context. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the dinner last night. It was one of the best things we have had since we came to America. Uh, so I want to start by introducing my country to you guys so that you can at least understand where we come from and how our country looks like. And then I'll drive you back to history and up to today and how the country has, has tried to to renew after the genocide. So uh, Rwanda is the smallest country in, in, in the central of Africa. It's, it's really small that if we try to, to fit it in Texas, it will take us like more than 50 times. So you can imagine how small Rwanda is. With just 12 million uh, as the population. And then we speak one language. We don't have different languages. It's just one language, Kinyarwanda, and English being our second language. So uh, like any other country in Africa, Rwanda was colonized. But then when colonialists came in our country, they did not find a perfect society. Rwanda was divided. We had uh, different classes. But then those social classes were just three social classes. We had the Tutsis, the Hutus, and the Twa. Now, for one to subscribe to membership of any of those social classes, you had to prove it by a number of cows that you owned. For us, in our culture, we believe that cows are one of the, like, a sign of wealth. If you have cows, it means you're rich. So, for the Tutsis, they had to own more than 10 cows. Like, if you had more than 10 cows, or if you had many cows, you, you were considered to be a Tutsi. If you had less than 10 cows, you were considered to be a Hutu. And if you lived in the bush and uh, we, the, the, the pygmies the, were the people we considered to be Twa. Now, when colonialists came in our country, they tried to change the mindset and the, the ideology of those social classes that we had by saying that actually there, is, there are some physical attributes that make it so different that a Tutsi can become a Hutu or a Hutu become a Tutsi. 
So what they said was that a Tutsi is a tall person, light-skinned, and uh, with a long nose. They say that a Hutu is a short person, big nose, and then very dark. Then with that, it means that now it was not possible for you to work hard and become a Tutsi, or even, even if you don't work hard, then you can become a Hutu. Then they removed what we call social mobility. Then with that kind of mentality, so in, in, in Africa, uh, when colonialists came in, they tried to use one of the policies we call divide and rule, which was uh, like you have to divide people so that it can be easy for your administration to rule or govern them. And then what they did again was uh, indirect rule, which is mainly they give power to the local, to, to a group of people in the local community, so they be the ones to take in charge, and then for them they do everything else behind the scene. So even when they're to do something bad, the, the, the minority or the people who don't have the power, they actually blame the group that is leading, yet actually they're not the people making decisions. Now, what they did, they gave power to the group of Tutsis. Uh, when they came in, they gave the power to the group of Tutsis. Tutsis were the ones in power for a long period of time. Now, in 1959, that's when like most of African countries started to demand for their independence. They started to, to start uh, what you call Pan-Africans movement, whereby they had to fight against the, the idea of colonialism. That's when you learn about different, uh, different heroes of Africa, Martin Luther, I mean, um, Nelson Mandela, that's when you hear about, um, uh, that's when you hear about Gaddafi, that's when you hear about Kwame Nkrumah. Those are African heroes who tried to fight for the, for the independence of, uh, of their countries. Now in Rwanda we also had the same people. A group of Tutsis started to demand for the independence of the country. But then colonialists felt like actually the group of Tutsis who is now, which is now leading is actually bringing troubles to our administration. So what they had to do, they had to remove the power from the Tutsis so they don't have bargaining power, and then they had to give the power to the other group of Hutus who were not leading before. So when Hutus took over power, they, they, they used it as an opportunity to revenge, to revenge on the Tutsis who were in power for a long time. Starting from 1959 to 1960-something, 1960 to 1962 when Rwanda got independence, many Tutsis were sent out of the country. Many Tutsis were killed. Almost 6,000 Tutsis were killed within just a period of four, of four years. Now, it continued like that up to uh, 1994, a year that many Rwandans will never forget, a year that when others were celebrating the World Cup, Rwanda was just in tears. On the 6th of April, when the plane that was carrying the former president, Abdiarimana, was shot down, starting from that night, Hutus made a promise that they are going to kill Tutsis to the point that another generation that will come will never recognize that Tutsis existed. You know, we always say that maybe the story that America can tell is the 9-11. But in our country, we had three 9-11s every day for 100 days. That's 10,000 people dying every day. Seven people dying every minute. Teachers killing their own students. Students killing their own classmates. Neighbors killing their own neighbors. Uncles kill their own nephews. Pastors killed their own followers. Politicians preached hate. They told people to go on streets and kill because they felt like killing was doing a public service. People died day and night. People prayed to be killed by a machete because they felt like, people prayed to be killed by a gun because they felt like machetes would hurt more. It wasn't about how you prefer to die. It wasn't about how you prefer to live. It was about which death is not going to be so painful. Which death is going to be so fast so that at least I can die but not feel the pain of death for a hundred days, for a hundred days. And when people talk about the genocide, sometimes 
they put a full stop on the survivor and the perpetrator. Because it's very easy to name them those names because they survived and others killed. But the question is, is it right? I personally, I was born on a family that contributed to the genocide. My uncles killed. My father was there during the genocide in charge of security of people. But you can't call me a perpetrator because I never killed anyone. I never took up a machete and cut the head of someone. Isaac was born on a family of survivors. He lost a mother, he lost aunties. But you can't call him a survivor because he never survived, he wasn't there. We are all victims, right? But the difference is, I feel guilty, I feel shame, I feel everything that my uncles felt after the genocide. I regret for being born on the wrong side. Isaac feels sad, feels anger, feels like he can't revenge. So you can imagine in a country where by 65% of the people are the people who were born after the genocide, who have the mentality that I just talked about, who feel shame and the anger. What would happen if we do not make sure that we have platforms that allow Isaac to see me as a brother, that allow me to live in a society whereby I don't feel guilty of what happened but look forward to build a nation whereby we say genocide never happen again and we actually mean it, that it can never happen again. That is why I debate exists. We try to build a platform for the youth, for the young people, whereby they come, discuss, argue, but again unite. Because it's very easy to change someone's mentality. And it's very easy to start from the pain that people feel so you can change the way they make decisions and the way they feel about other human beings. You know, I always feel like when we are doing the tour, it's a great opportunity for us to teach Americans, to teach the world that what happened in Rwanda can happen anywhere else. What happened in Rwanda can happen to anyone else. And what happened to me is, can happen to anyone else. So I'm going to call upon Kelia to come and uh, read a story of one of the colleagues we work with in IDB Rwanda. But we are not reading for you the stories because we feel like they are painful or because we want you guys to feel pity for us. We are reading the stories for you, for you guys to see that at least there is hope after conflict. Thank you very much. A letter to my future child. Dear future child, let me tell you about your grandfather. The main adjective that would have described him was responsible. He loved his family so much, us, his children, his wife, and in an inexplicably strong way, his siblings and their children. He was born fourth in 10 and was among the few who actually went to and finished high school by the time of his death. In his inexplicable love, he had paid for the studies of his younger siblings without a single complaint, even insisting, putting aside his needs. He had no extra money for all that, 
and he was sometimes forcing him to go to work by foot under the burning 2 p.m. sun of Kigali that you get to know. As you can imagine, he was whip smart and a spot on analyst. Due to the fear of exposing his family to the cruelty of the regime at that time, I assume he never engaged in public political demonstrations or debate. He did not support the regime, on the contrary, but he was just a man trying to protect his family, silence being the only way. In his analysis, he relied heavily on logic. I mean, it is logical that the UN would never let massacres happen, right? He trusted them as anyone else could have, and they failed him. They abandoned him and a million lives to die. He was killed the day after their departure, Saturday, 9th April, 1994. Upon hearing the news that they were leaving, he turned to my mother and said, Ce sont les catacombes. Again, his analysis was spot on. Before being shot dead, he pleaded for our lives. I, my siblings, and my mothers. Don't kill my wife and kids, he said. Did I mention he was a man to whom everyone, upon meeting him, even you, I'm sure, at the end of this letter, was drawn to his immense respect for him? The dignity with which he conducted himself gave him almost a sovereign aura. Maybe the killer saw an incredibly respectable man who had accepted his capital sentence with almost sympathy and comprehension for the killers. I get it, I have to die. They surely thought he deserved death for having the wrong box checked in his ID. But they also saw a man scandalized by the idea of even considering killing women and children. Maybe what went through their mind is, yeah, sure, he's a Tutsi, a Ninyenzi, a cockroach, a good-hearted one who has to die. But his wife and children, that would be a little too much. Or maybe they were just in too much of a hurry to go and kill our neighbor and his family before it was dark. Maybe the chief of those in Nerahame had a stern wife who expected him home early. Our neighbor, his children and wife were massacred, leaving only one survivor. The bullet touched one of her kidneys, which left her with struggles to conceive for years as a married woman. Or it was just because they hoped to come back at midnight and rape my mother, whose ID had the right box checked, in the safety of the night, as they had told her, wait for us, we'll come back at midnight. She did not wait. A woman told her she will surely die, us with her that midnight. We hurriedly left the house, Struggling to find the path among looters, busy tearing apart the house my mother had never wanted in first place. To find refugee at one of our neighbors. And that is how we escaped our first encounter with death. And there were many encounters with death after that in the following three months. months. But that's another story for another time. Your grandfather pleaded for our lives and for whatever reason we lived. He gave us a chance to grow up and become men. He gave you a chance to see light one day. But was he perfect? No. He was human, made mistakes, and even hurt people just like any normal person. Two years ago, I discovered some things about him that left me deeply disappointed and wondering if we would have gotten along. That was me forgetting that I, myself, 
I'm as far from perfect as one can be. And I decided to forgive him for something I'm not even sure he would have been sorry for. But that's life, baby. Nobody is perfect. There must be a question on your mind right now. Why address this letter to you, especially that I do not plan for your arrival for at least next seven years? Don't I have friends? Tell me, who else would be better to talk about a relative you love but never met than a relative you love but have never met? Who else would you tell about how it feels to lose your father over something as futile as the shape of a nose? To have to listen to your friends say how cool it is to have a dad because moms are so strict. To realize you could become president one day but that you will never know. To want to make someone proud you're not sure you would have liked. To grow up wondering if you got your weird skin toes from him. To be moved by someone saying you have his eyes. To have lost him when you were eight months old. To remember he's not there during celebrations because you see tears and nostalgia in your mother's eyes. To want to figure out why the surviving uncles and aunts were virtually absent in your childhood. Was the responsibility too much or is it your mixed blood? I'm sure you will listen, understand, and maybe cry a little when you find out how much his forced absence affected me. I hope the reason will be that I will have chosen the right father for you, even though I know as much about a good father as I know about astrology. Astrology has something to do with the stars, right? I hope to find someone who will heal my wounds and fill the void my own father left through loving you. I hope you will not find yourself in the position I'm in today, 20 years old, talented and with success, waiting for you, but clueless about the most primitive form of love. Maybe the reason why I'm already worried about this is because I had a wonderful mother who put aside the unimaginable pain of being widowed after only five years of marriage, 28 years old, with three kids to raise us in the best way she could. She made sure we did not realize something as big as a father was missing. She succeeded so well at this until I was 14 and she wouldn't give me the permissions a father probably would have given me. I thought fathers were completely useless just people you call dad, a name that has as much meaning to me as slow. I've only seen it in pictures. I don't even think I realize up to now the usefulness of a father. And I hope that watching your father with you will teach me and heal me. Take care, see you maybe in seven years or more. And hold on tight, someone already deeply loves you and is planning ahead for you. Love your future mother. But I think that Mecca has already provided us with a context of what happened in Rwanda. And the other thing that um, I hope you read uh, as Kelly was reading the story, you were able to see um, just how much Genocide affects the life not only of those that were present at that time, but those who were born afterwards. You see, one of the things that um, I wanted to do for the next uh, few minutes is to answer two main questions. Uh, the first question is, what can make a man wake up one day and decide to kill a person that he gave birth to? Guys. So I want to answer the question of what can make a man wake up one day and decide to kill the person that they give birth to? And the second question that I'd like to answer is, why should you care? Because even in the best case scenario, many of you are you know, here in Taro, Texas. It is about 26 to 27 hours away from Rwanda. 
it would take you almost two days to get to Rwanda. And the question is, why should you care about something that happened 24 years ago in another continent, and why is that important? See, what I would like to, there's one thing that I believe, is that if, if we said that the issues of genocide are issues of Rwandans, I wish we could say that, because that will make the world such a better place. Because you see, all we we'll have to do, just like Mecca said, Rwanda is the size of Maryland. It's one of the smallest countries in the world, and Rwanda is the smallest country in Africa. If we were to say that the issues of genocide are issues of only Rwandans, life would be so much better. Because all we we'll have to do is basically just build wars around the country, and then just keep Rwandans there, and they can just kill one another. And that's it. But sadly, you see, the issues of genocide are issues of how we treat the other, however you might qualify the other to be. How do we treat those that are different from us? And how do we treat those who see the world differently and live the world differently? What I would like to do is to show you the process that allows us to commit violence to others. Because you see, it's, I believe that there's something about us as human beings that makes it impossible for us to hold or for us to do any violence against another person when we see them as people. Uh, we're in a Christian school, so I would say I believe that God has, he says that I have put the notions of right and wrong on their hearts so that they may not sin. I believe that God has put in each one of us a certain conscious that makes it impossible for us to commit violence against another human being. But however, in order for that to happen, we have to go through a gradual process that, has, that allows us to justify violence against another group of people. And what I would like to do is to explain that process for you. Because just like I've said, I believe that there's something in us that makes it impossible to do violence so the question is, why do we still do violence onto others? So I would like to begin by explaining the process. And this is, again, this is a process that has been studied by uh, different scholars. So the first thing that we have to know as human beings is that human beings have different needs, right? But I would like to outline some of those needs. The first need that we all have is a need for identity. Each one of us wants to answer the question of, who are you? I'll tell you the truth, nobody ever wakes up in the morning and says, I am just like everybody else and that's the best thing in the world. We all want to feel like we're special. We all want to feel like we're different. And you see, there's nothing wrong with that need. The second need that each one of us has is a need to belong. We all want to belong to a home. We all want to belong to a group. We all want to belong to a cause. Right? So it's not only that I define myself in a certain way, but I also like to belong to a group that define themselves in that specific way. So those two needs are needs that each one of us has, whether they stay in Kigali in Rwanda or they stay here in Terrace, Texas. Now, to explain the process, the first thing that we do as human beings is we define, we categorize ourselves. We all like to categorize ourselves. Now, let me tell you, even people who claim that they don't like to categorize people, they are lying because they categorize themselves as people who don't categorize others. And it's very simple because we need to simplify the world, right? It would be impossible for us to treat human beings as individuals. So we need to create stereotypes, we need to create categories that make it easier for us to interact with the rest of the world. The first thing that we do is we classify and categorize ourselves. The second thing that we do is we symbolize. We put symbols to those categories, right? So now it's no longer about this is us, this is who we are, but there's also something that makes us different from others. Because when we start putting symbols, we say, well, you know, we're, we're, there's certain things that we do that make it different, that make us different from others. To give you an example, I like to take the most prominent color here is black. People wearing black, right? I'm wearing black too, so you know. The first thing that people are going to say is that there is people who wear black and there's the rest of the world. 
The second thing that we say is that there's something special about people who wear black. People who wear black tend to be smarter than others. People who wear black tend to be more creative. There's just something that makes them different from others. So once we have created an us, then we create a them. Because the them is the people who are different from the way that we define us. Does that make sense? So then once we have gone from us and them, the next step that we have to do is we create pluralization. Because we say that not only are we different, but there's something that makes it that we cannot interact with one another. Because you see, another need that human beings have is a need for a positive identity. And when we come in the world believing that there's not enough for all of us, then we have to find something that gives us an edge over the others. So now we have said that there's an us, there's a them, and then there's an us versus them. When we create that us versus them, we're starting to go down a path that is hard to reverse. The next thing that we do once we have created an us and them is now we create, we say that not only are they different from us, not only are, uh, can we not interact because they're on two polar sides, but the next step is to say, not only are they different, but we start dehumanizing the other. Because you see, again, remember, we said that there's something in us that makes it impossible to commit violence against another person. Key word being person. And that is why when you study history of mankind, one of the things that people do is they start dehumanizing the other. And they start justifying things that they will not justify for themselves. Because you know what? All the other people that are not wearing black, there's something that makes them not human. They are barbaric, right? They abide by, by values that are different from our own, right? They're not totally human beings. So then when they're not like human beings, what do you do? We treat them like animals, right? Because once we have turned into people's minds and said, that, no, they're not just like you, they're animals, then it becomes easier to justify violence against them. Because you see in Rwanda, they said the Tutsis are cockroaches. What do you do to a cockroach? You step on it, right? Would you ever feel bad for killing a cockroach? No. In Nazi Germany, they said that the Jews were rats. What do you do to a rat? Same thing, kill it. And then once we have created in our minds and people's minds, the idea that the other is less than human, then we start justifying discrimination, right? We start putting in place policies and we use the, the power of the state to commit violence against them. There might not be physical violence, but it might be structural violence. When we start removing or removing resources from them so they cannot do what is needed for them to fulfill their potential. And then once we have discriminated, then we start persecuting them. And then we go down to elimination. You see, genocide is the worst kind of elimination because genocide is the physical death of others. But elimination can come in different ways. You see, elimination can come not only in silencing the other, it can come in also making sure that they do not have whatever they need to, to live. Because you see, human beings are our biggest lie to ourselves, And this is a lie that we tell ourselves as an individual, and this is a lie that we tell to ourselves as communities. The biggest lie we tell ourselves is we're different. That's the biggest lie. Because if you study history, you would find that the same pattern happens over and over and over again. That in every community where we have more than one individual, the same issues happen over and over again. What Rwanda shows us is that the moment we have started dehumanizing the other, the moment we have seen the other as less than human, we are also dehumanizing ourselves in the process. Because you see, those that were committing genocide in Rwanda, their number one goal was to say they'll make a world a better place by removing Tutsis. But none of them ever thought about the generation that will come from them. 
24 years later, how does a kid of a perpetrator feel when they have to endure the legacy that their father left them? But the reality is that the father thought, or the uncles, or the, the people that were committing crimes thought that they were doing a service. So I'd like to ask the second question, which is, why should you care? Why should you care? Sadly, like I said, and I really mean it, it would be easy to say that issues of violence are issues of randoms, or issues of evil is issues of randoms, or it would be easy to say that evil can only happen in Rwanda. But sadly, the line that crosses good from evil crosses every man's heart. If I ask each one of you, are you capable of doing what people did in Rwanda? Your first reaction will be no. But the sobering truth is, given the right circumstances, given the right environment, each one of us is capable of doing what happened in Rwanda. And that is a sobering truth. I had a friend visit once and she said that she was hoping that when she gets to Rwanda and she meets people that commit a genocide, that they will look like animals. But she said that the saddest thing is that when she met them, they looked just like her. And the people that committed crimes in Rwanda look just like you. But I think also it will be important not only to share the story of Rwanda on, from the tragedy, but I also like to share about the history of Rwanda after the genocide. After 1994 genocide, you see, after the Holocaust, a lot of Jews left, they left Germany. Some went to Israel, some came to the United States, some went all over Europe. But in Rwanda, people went back and lived in the same community as people who had, um, uh, the same community as people who had committed the crimes. I'd like you to imagine the magnitude of that. Imagine if the, terror, the family of the terrorist of 9-11 had to live in the same neighborhoods as the family of the victims of 9-11. To put it even better, imagine if the kids of slave owners had to go to the same school and the same community as the kids of former slaves. How do you do that? But in Rwanda, that's what's happening. So Rwanda shows that Rwandans are trying to live together after such a horrific, <coughs> horrific crime like the genocide against the Tutsis. So Rwanda shows on one side what happens when we all decide to eliminate the other. But Rwanda also shows that it is possible for people to live together. Rwandans are trying to live together after the genocide in 1994. Mecca told you, how would you envision a kid of a perpetrator living for the next three months with a kid who lost a parent because of the genocide? For me, I think Rwanda shows us what is possible. And I'll answer the last time, why should you care? I always say, if Rwandans can try, keyword being trying, to live with one another after a horrific crime like genocide, then nobody in the world has an excuse. Nobody in the world has an excuse. Some friends of mine told me, oh, I can't talk to anybody uh, who voted for Trump, or oh, I can't talk to anybody who voted for Hillary Clinton. I can't even engage with them. And I always say, Yes, you want us to feel, you want to feel like that makes you special, but the truth of the matter is, if I have seen a kid of a perpetrator engaging and studying and living with a kid of a survivor, no one else has an excuse. No one else. So, what I would like to do is, I would like to open the floor for questions. Um, honestly, we always say that we are here because we think it's important to put, uh, to put a story or to put a person behind all the things that you have learned. Um, I know that some of you have watched Hotel Rwanda and I know some of you have been learning about Rwanda, but we are hoping that we can answer any questions that you have. To be honest, there's no question that is out of hand. Please ask us anything 
that, um, that you have on your mind and will be willing and wanting to engage with you. And um, uh, you've been sitting for quite some time, so after a few questions, what we want to do is to do some traditional dancing. I know some of you, you look like you could, you could dance a little bit. All right, does that sound like a good plan? All right, so thank you very much, and uh, please uh, feel free to ask us anything you want.